Hi there, it's Friday the 31st of May 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Welcome to this special edition of ITB, in which I'll review the top international tax cases so far in 2019. Let's get started. So far in 2019, I have presented over 70 cases in ITB. In this special edition video, I select the top seven of those cases, my Premier League of cases, so to speak, based on how interesting the international tax issues are in those cases. And for those seven cases, I provide a full recap of my analysis. So, if you've been watching ITB every week, you would have heard it all before, but not all at one time. After going through those seven cases, I then present the best of the rest. So, here's my Premier League selection of seven cases. We have a case from India on the PE definition in the India-US Treaty. A Dutch case on most favoured nation provisions. In fact, a so-called conduit MFN situation, a royalty withholding tax case from Korea, an interesting Australian case on source in regard to a profit derived by a private equity fund, two landmark anti-avoidance decisions given by the European Court of Justice, and finally, two interesting transfer pricing cases, one from Finland and one from Denmark. Let's get started. The first case is the appeal decision in the GE Energy Parts case, delivered by the Delhi High Court. This decision is an appeal from the 2017 decision of the Delhi Income Tax Appellate Tribunal, and that was one of the most significant cases globally in 2017. Why do I say that? Because this case is a great illustration of what can go wrong in a multinational group in regard to the PE definition if the group does not strictly recognise the separate identity of legal entities. The case concerns the PE definition in Article 5 of the India-US Treaty. That definition is relevantly the same as the definition in the OECD Model Treaty before the 2017 update. However, the numbering is slightly different. To avoid confusion, I will use the numbering in the OECD Model. The background to this case is that the Indian tax authorities had issued assessments to numerous non-resident companies within the GE Group. These companies were tax resident in various countries, including the UK, Japan, the US, Canada, Italy, Mauritius and Singapore. The assessments claimed that the companies had PEs in India under the relevant double tax treaties. As the issues were the same with all the companies, the court focused on just one in this case, GE Energy Parts Inc., a US company, hence the India-US Treaty. The case concerns the activities of seven expatriate employees and their Indian support team. The expats were employed by various non-Indian companies within the GE Group. However, it appears that the employer companies were not amongst the particular companies which had received assessments. The expats were seconded to India to fulfil the role of Indian country leader and other senior positions for various GE global business divisions. Their role was described in the Tribunal's 2017 decision in this way. 
These persons are working for various direct businesses of the GE Group in India, which are neither being conducted through a subsidiary or joint venture company. These persons are India head of different businesses, and they are being supported by a team of persons who are employed by one of several Indian resident companies. The court looked first at Article 5.1, the fixed place of business PE. All of the seven expats and their Indian support team permanently worked at some office premises in New Delhi. Those office premises were officially occupied by the Indian Liaison Office of another US company within the GE Group. Based on those facts, you can see that most of the conditions for an Article 5.1 PE were clearly satisfied in this case. There's a specific geographical place, the Liaison Office premises in New Delhi, which is at the disposal of the expats for a sufficiently long period of time. Only one further condition is required, and that's the tricky one through which the business of the enterprise is wholly or partly carried on. Which of course begs the question, which company is the enterprise? In 2017, the tribunal said this, The facts indicate two broader things. First is that these expats worked in India for different business interests of GE Group and their activities were not confined to the business of a particular entity. Second is that they were heading the operation of GE overseas entities in India. From the facts, it is crystal clear that the expats were India country heads or working at the top positions, managing the business, securing orders, and doing everything possible that could be done here in regard to the Indian operations of GE overseas entities in India. It has nowhere been denied, and rightly so, that the business model and role of the expats is similar in regard to all the businesses in India. This view is further strengthened from the fact that the expats were not confined to a particular GE entity, but working for one of its three major business lines, namely infrastructure, industrial and healthcare. And so the tribunal in 2017 held that the seven expats and their Indian support team were carrying on the business in India of each of the non-resident companies which had received assessments, including GE Energy Parts Inc. And therefore, according to the tribunal, each of those companies would have an Article 5.1 PE at the Liaison Office premises in New Delhi, subject to the preparatory or auxiliary exception in Article 5.4, which I will consider in a moment. Interestingly, the taxpayers appear to have effectively conceded this point in the Delhi High Court appeal. The court noted that the taxpayers did not make any new submissions on this point, and the court therefore adopted the tribunal's conclusion. But the taxpayers did make submissions on the preparatory or auxiliary exception in Article 5.4e. The key argument was that the seven expats and the Indian support team were merely liaising with prospective customers in India. Such activity is not part of the core activities in the business of any of the non-resident companies, and therefore it is of a preparatory or auxiliary character. That argument was rejected by the court. It is clear that in the kind of activity that GE carries out, that is, manufacture and supply of highly specialised and technically customised equipment, the core activity of developing the customer, identifying a client, 
approaching that customer, communicating the available options, discussing technical and financial terms of the agreement, even price negotiations, needed a collaborative process in which the potential client, along with the seven expats and their Indian support team, had to intensely negotiate the intricacies of the technical and commercial parameters of the articles. This also involved discussing the contractual terms and the associated consideration payable, the warranty and other commercial terms. No doubt at later stages of contract negotiations, the India office could not take a final decision, but had to await the final word from headquarters. But that did not mean that the India office was just for mute data collection and information dissemination. The discharge of vital responsibilities relating to finalisation of commercial terms, or at least a prominent involvement in the contract finalisation process, was not a preparatory or auxiliary activity. And so the court concluded that the preparatory or auxiliary exception in Article 5.4e was not satisfied. And therefore, all of the non-resident companies had Article 5.1 PEs in India. The Indian tax authorities had also taken the view that the seven expats and their Indian support team caused the non-resident companies to have Article 5.5 contract concluding dependent agent PEs in India. It was accepted by the court that the seven expats and their Indian support team participated in contract negotiations with the customers, but they did not conclude contracts with the customers in a way that made the contracts legally binding on the non-resident companies. Nevertheless, the court determined that the concludes contracts test was satisfied because of the participation in important parts of the negotiation process. In doing so, the court rejected the relevant part of the OECD commentary and found support in the 2002 Italian Supreme Court decision in the Philip Morris case. The court said this, the court notices that since the OECD commentary appears to be contradictory across paragraphs 32 and 33, it cannot be relied upon wholly. The term authority to conclude does not mean all elements and details, since that would make other portion of the clause redundant. Therefore, it only means that the activity needs to be core in nature. This is the opinion in Philip Morris. The participation of representatives or employees of a resident company in a phase of the conclusion of a contract between a foreign company and another resident entity may fall within the concept of authority to conclude contracts in the name of the foreign company. I don't agree with this Article 5.5 analysis, but I do agree with the Article 5.1 and 5.4 analysis, and that would mean that Article 5.5 is moot. The final point in the case concerns the calculation of the profits attributable to the PEs under Article 7 of the various treaties. The tribunal had decided in favour of the global fractional apportionment method which has been used in India for a number of years, following the Rolls-Royce case in 2007. The court agreed with the tribunal's decision and application of this method. The second case is a decision by the Netherlands Supreme Court and it's all about most favoured nation provisions. Let's start with the facts. A South African resident company owned 100% of the shares in a Netherlands resident company. In 2013, the Netherlands company paid a dividend to the South African parent. 
5% dividend withholding tax was deducted from the dividend and remitted to the Dutch tax authorities. The 5% rate was in accordance with Article 10.2a of the South Africa Netherlands Treaty. However, in 2014, the taxpayer requested a refund of the full amount of the withholding tax. The refund request was pursuant to Article 1010, an MFN provision. Let me read it out. If under any convention for the avoidance of double taxation concluded after the date of conclusion of this convention between the Republic of South Africa and a third country, South Africa limits its taxation on dividends as contemplated in Article 102A to a rate lower, including exemption from taxation or taxation on a reduced taxable base, than the rate provided for in Article 102A, the same rate, the same exemption, or the same reduced taxable base as provided for in the convention with that third state shall automatically apply in both contracting states under this convention as from the date of the entry into force of the convention with that third state. Let me make a number of points in regard to this Article 1010. Firstly, you will notice that the provision is triggered if South Africa concludes a relevant convention with a third country. The provision is not triggered if the Netherlands concludes such a convention with a third country. However, if the provision is triggered, the rate reduction applies to both South Africa and the Netherlands. Secondly, the provision is triggered if there is a relevant convention for the avoidance of double taxation concluded with a third country after the date of conclusion of the South Africa-Netherlands Treaty. This raises the question, what's a convention for the avoidance of double taxation? Is that phrase limited to a full-blown double tax treaty or does it also cover a protocol to an existing double tax treaty? And thirdly, there's the issue of when is a convention concluded? Is it the date of signature or the date it enters into force? In regard to those last two points, the court accepted the views expressed by the lower level court. The phrase convention for the avoidance of double taxation covers both a full-blown double tax treaty and a protocol which amends an existing double tax treaty. And the date of conclusion of a convention is its date of entry into force. The South Africa Netherlands double tax treaty entered into force and thus was concluded on the 28th of December 2008. That's a critical date because Article 1010 requires the convention between South Africa and the third country to be concluded after that date. South Africa had concluded a number of treaties which provide for a 0% dividend withholding tax rate. However, all of these treaties were concluded before 2008. For example, the South Africa Kuwait Treaty, which provides for a 0% rate on dividends, entered into force and thus was concluded on the 25th of April 2006. And so the taxpayer pointed to the South Africa Sweden Treaty. Now, the South Africa Sweden Treaty is interesting. Firstly, this is one of those treaties, like the South Africa Kuwait Treaty, which provide for a 0% rate on dividends, but which were concluded before 2008. The South Africa Sweden Treaty was concluded on the 25th of December 1995. But secondly, this treaty was amended by a protocol which was concluded on the 18th of March 2012. And remember, a protocol is itself a convention for the avoidance of double taxation. This protocol did two interesting things. Firstly, 
it changed the tax rate on dividends to 5% or 15%, depending on the level of shareholding. And secondly, it included its own MFN provision, the new Article 10.6. The increase in the dividend withholding tax rate to 5% or 15% is not going to help the taxpayer. But the MFN provision, Article 10.6, does. If any agreement or convention between South Africa and a third state provides that South Africa shall exempt from tax dividends arising in South Africa or limit the tax charged in South Africa on such dividends to a rate lower than 5%, such exemption or lower rate shall automatically apply to dividends arising in South Africa and beneficially owned by a resident of Sweden, and dividends arising in Sweden and beneficially owned by a resident of South Africa. Now, there's one major difference between this MFN provision, Article 10.6 of the South Africa-Sweden Treaty, and Article 10.10 of the South Africa-Netherlands Treaty. Article 10.6 merely refers to any agreement or convention between South Africa and a third state. It doesn't expressly require that the agreement or convention be concluded after a particular date. And that allowed the taxpayer to put together this argument. In the South Africa Netherlands Treaty, a 0% rate for dividends is available under the MFN provision, Article 1010, only if that rate is available under a convention between South Africa and a third state, which is concluded after 2008. Although the South Africa Kuwait Treaty does provide for a 0% rate on dividends, that treaty was concluded in 2006, and so that doesn't count, at least directly. However, under the South Africa-Sweden Treaty, the MFN provision, Article 10.6, allows a 0% rate if any agreement or convention between South Africa and a third state provides for such a rate, regardless of when that agreement or convention is concluded. Therefore, according to the taxpayer, the 0% rate under the South Africa Kuwait Treaty triggers the MFN provision in the South Africa Sweden Treaty. And so the 0% rate applies under the South Africa Sweden Treaty. Critically, the MFN provision, Article 10.6, in the South Africa Sweden Treaty is contained in the protocol which was concluded in 2012. That protocol therefore qualifies for the MFN provision, Article 1010, in the South Africa-Netherlands Treaty. So, according to the argument, although the 0% rate in the South Africa-Kuwait Treaty cannot directly trigger the MFN provision in the South Africa-Netherlands Treaty, it can do so indirectly via the South Africa-Sweden Treaty. You could call this an MFN conduit situation. That argument was successful in the lower court and it was also successful in the Supreme Court. A very interesting case. But before I leave this topic, let me point out something odd about Article 10.6 in the South Africa-Sweden Treaty. As you can see, it does not require that the agreement or convention between South Africa and a third state be concluded after a particular date. Thus, according to the court, it can be triggered by agreements or conventions which were concluded before, even years before, Article 10.6 was introduced into the South Africa-Sweden Treaty by the 2012 Protocol. But that's curious. At the time the 2012 protocol was concluded, South Africa had concluded several treaties, including the South Africa-Kuwait Treaty, 
which provided for a 0% rate. That being the case, you do wonder why Article 10.6 was necessary. Why not just put the 0% rate into Article 10.2 of the treaty? A possible explanation is that the two countries wanted to allow the 0% rate to apply for only so long as a treaty between South Africa and a third country provides for a 0% rate. For example, if some years after the 2012 protocol was concluded, the 0% rate no longer applies in South Africa's treaties with third countries, then arguably Article 10.6 turns off the 0% rate in the South Africa-Sweden Treaty. Maybe. The next case is a decision of the Korean Supreme Court. It's called Samsung Electronics and it concerns the imposition of Korean royalty withholding tax. Here's the relevant structure. A US LLC owned 100% of the shares in an Irish resident company. The Irish company owned various US registered patents. The Irish company licensed those patents to Samsung Electronics, a Korean resident company. The license allowed Samsung to use the patents in Korea. Under the Korea Island Treaty, zero source country tax may be imposed on royalties. However, a 15% royalty withholding tax is permitted under the Korea US Treaty. The Korean tax authorities argued that the Irish company was interposed in order to secure the zero withholding tax on royalties. It argued that the Irish company was not the beneficial owner of the royalties under Korea's domestic law beneficial ownership concept. Instead, said the tax authorities, the royalties were beneficially owned by the US LLC and therefore 15% royalty withholding tax should apply under the Korea-US Treaty. That beneficial ownership argument was accepted by the Korean Supreme Court, but the court's analysis under the Korea-US Treaty went against the tax authorities. I'll explain that in a moment. But first, if this situation sounds a little familiar, it's because we've been here before. The Korean Supreme Court in 2014 decided a similar case against the tax authorities. But the tax authorities have taken this recent Samsung Electronics case to the Supreme Court in order to try a second time. As I said, they've lost again. Okay, let me take you through the Supreme Court's analysis. And the first point I will note is that the Korea-US Treaty is a very unusual treaty. It's not constructed in the same way as the OECD and UN model treaties. And it contains a number of provisions that you don't find in those model treaties. The royalties article is Article 14. The term royalties is defined in Article 14.4a to mean payment of any kind made as consideration for the use of or the right to use copyrights, patents, designs, models, plans, secret processes or formulae, trademarks or other like property or rights, or knowledge, experience or skill, know-how. And Article 14.1 relevantly says this, the tax imposed by one of the contracting states on royalties derived from sources within that contracting state by a resident of the other contracting state shall not exceed 15% of the gross amount thereof. That highlighted phrase, derived from sources within that contracting state, is unusual. The corresponding phrase in the OECD and UN model treaties is arising in a contracting state. That phrase is undefined in the OECD model treaty, 
but it has a definition in Article 12.5 of the UN Model Treaty. In the Korea-US Treaty, the phrase derived from sources within that contracting state is defined in Article 6.3. Royalties described in Paragraph 4 of Article 14 for the use of or the right to use property described in such paragraph shall be treated as income from sources within one of the contracting states only if paid for the use of or the right to use such property within that contracting state. At this point, the tax authorities say, well, under the license, Samsung Electronics has been given the right to use the patents in Korea. Therefore, the royalties paid by Samsung Electronics must be paid for the use of or the right to use such property within Korea. But the Supreme Court said no, the patents are US registered, not Korean registered. According to the court, a patent exists as property in the jurisdiction where it is registered. Therefore, you can use or have a right to use a patent only in that jurisdiction, which is the US, not Korea. As I mentioned earlier, the Supreme Court decided a similar case against the tax authorities in 2014. But that wasn't the first time that this issue arose. In fact, in 2008, the Korean government tried to remedy this situation. Parliament amended the domestic income tax law to insert a provision which says that where a patent is registered outside Korea, but it is used for manufacturing or sales in Korea, then the patent shall be deemed to be used in Korea, regardless of whether or not it is registered in Korea. In this Samsung Electronics case, the tax authorities argued that the word use in Article 6.3 is not defined in the treaty and therefore, in accordance with the equivalent of Article 3.2, it should take its Korean domestic law meaning, which is in accordance with the provision inserted in 2008. The treaty provision which is equivalent to Article 3.2 is Article 2.2, which relevantly says this, any term used in this convention and not defined in this convention shall, unless the context otherwise requires, have the meaning which it has under the laws of the contracting state whose tax is being determined. But the Supreme Court held that Article 2.2 cannot be applied in this situation. It said that the meaning of the word use in regard to patents is clear from the text of Article 6.3. As a patent exists as property only in the jurisdiction where it is registered, the use of a patent can only be in that jurisdiction. So in terms of Article 2.2, the context otherwise requires. And so the court concluded that the royalties paid by Samsung Electronics were not treated by Article 6.3 as income from sources within Korea. That meant that Article 14.1 did not apply to the royalties. So what happens then? Under the OECD and UN model treaties, the answer would be go to the business profits article and as the US LLC does not have a PE in Korea, the business profits article would provide an exemption from Korean tax. But as I said before, the Korea-US treaty has some unusual provisions. The business profits article, Article 8, uses the term industrial or commercial profits, which has a definition which excludes royalties unless derived through a PE in the source country. And there's no other income article in the treaty. But there is Article 4.1. A resident of one of the contracting states may be taxed by the other contracting state 
on any income from sources within that other contracting state and only on such income subject to any limitations set forth in this convention. For this purpose, the rules set forth in Article 6 shall be applied to determine the source of income. That reference to and only on such income means that Article 4.1 provides an exemption from Korean tax for income which is not sourced in Korea under the Article 6 source rules. And therefore, the court concluded that the treaty exempts the royalties from Korean tax. Now, I must say that I have a residual concern about that conclusion. If the US registered patents may only be used in the US, then what was Samsung Electronics paying for under the license? It did not obtain a right to use the US registered patents in Korea because that's not legally possible. Then what did it receive for its payments? Let me take you back to the definition of royalties in Article 14.4a. It refers to the use of or the right to use patents. But it also refers to the use of or the right to use other like property or rights or knowledge, experience or skill, know-how. Would any of those terms apply in this situation? Well, you could argue that the phrase other like property or rights should not apply because there was no property or right in regard to the use in Korea of US registered patents. But what about knowledge, experience or skill, know-how? Could the payments be fairly described as consideration for the use of knowledge, experience or skill, know-how? After all, a patent relates to an invention which is the product of knowledge, experience and skill. If that's correct, there could be an interesting result under the Article 6 source rules. Here's Article 6.3 again. Note the highlighted words for the use of or the right to use property described in such paragraph. Arguably, the phrase in Article 14.4a, knowledge, experience or skill, know-how, does not refer to property. If that's correct, then Article 6.3 does not set out the source rule for consideration for such items. Instead, I would think you would go to the residual source rule in Article 6.9, which relevantly says this. The source of any item of income to which paragraphs 1 through 8 of this article are not applicable shall be determined by each of the contracting states in accordance with its own law. Which would mean that Article 14.1 would apply after all, and a Korean 15% tax may be imposed. The next case is the full Federal Court of Australia's appeal decision in the RCF 4 case, which raises some interesting international tax issues. This is the latest instalment in a series of cases concerning RCF private equity funds. I dealt with an earlier RCF case called RCF 3 and with a lower court decision in RCF 4 in my previous video podcast series. You might remember them. This new case is long and complex, so I'll focus on those interesting international tax issues. But first, some background. Resource Capital Fund 4 LP, which I will call RCF4, is a limited partnership formed under Cayman Islands law. It has many limited partners, almost all of whom are US residents. It also has a general partner, which is another Cayman Islands limited partnership. RCF4 derived a profit 
on the acquisition and disposal of shares in an Australian holding company, which was the parent of a group which undertook mining operations in Australia. The case concerns the Australian tax treatment of that profit. An important point in this case is that RCF4 is classified as a corporate limited partnership for Australian income tax purposes. That means that for Australian income tax purposes, RCF4 is treated as if it is a company. In contrast, for US tax purposes, RCF4 is treated as a transparent partnership. So RCF4 is a classic hybrid entity. Another important point to note is that RCF4's disposal of shares in the Australian holding company was not by way of sale. Instead, it was by a scheme of arrangement. The significance of this point will be clear in a few moments. I'd like to take you through each of these issues. Nature of the profit, is it ordinary income? Source of the profit, treaty exemption, and can RCF4 rely on a public ruling? The first issue concerns whether the profit derived by RCF4 is ordinary income for Australian tax purposes. The share acquisition occurred in 2007 and the disposal took place in 2013. One of the witnesses who gave evidence in the lower court described the business activity of the RCF private equity funds in this way. The investors would go in, make the investment, improve the performance of the company concerned, and then seek to exit within three to six years after that time, having made a profit. Based on these facts, the lower court held that the profit does constitute ordinary income. This is consistent with a line of Australian cases which goes back several decades. The taxpayer did not appeal against the lower court's decision on this issue, and so the full federal court accepted that the profit was ordinary income. The second issue concerns the source of the profit. If the profit is ordinary income, it will be taxable in Australia only if it is sourced in Australia. Australia uses a practical, hard matter of fact approach to source questions. There are no specific rules. The facts in this case include some factors which point to a foreign source and some factors which point to an Australian source. However, the full federal court placed considerable weight on two particular factors. The first factor was described by the court in this way. The lower court noted that the business strategy of the taxpayer included substantial activity in Australia. That strategy comprised not merely a passive holding of shares, but an acquisition of shares and then a restructure and management of the underlying business in order to secure a better profit from a future sale. The general partner of RCF4 had entered into an agreement with RCF Management LLC for the management of the operation and investments of the partnership through an investment committee. For that purpose, RCF Management had entered into an agreement with RCF Management Proprietary Limited, RCF Management Australia, pursuant to which administration and management services were supplied. The lower court's findings include the fact that RCF Management Australia employees played an active role in the management, including the ultimate disposal of the investment. And whilst it is true that those employees were not employed by RCF4, they were employed by a company which, inferentially, was ultimately controlled by RCF4, or at the very least, 
existed to serve the interests of RCF4. In substance, those employees helped manage the investment in the Australian holding company for RCF4. And the second factor relates to the method of disposal, the scheme of arrangement, which is a special procedure under the Australian company law. The full federal court said this, what bound RCF4 to dispose of their shares and interests in the Australian holding company was not the entry into a contract of sale overseas, but the convening of the scheme meeting to be held in Australia. The approval at that meeting of the scheme of arrangement, the approval of that scheme by the court, and the lodging of the order of the court with the Australian corporate regulator. Approximate origin of the profits here was thus the scheme of arrangement, and the location of that arrangement was unquestionably in Australia. And so the full federal court concluded that the source of the profit was Australia. That means that the profit is taxable in Australia unless treaty exemption is available. The next issue is the availability of treaty exemption, the relevant treaty being the Australia-US Treaty. By a four to one majority, the full federal court held that RCF4 is not a resident of the US under that treaty, and thus it cannot claim treaty benefits. However, the court stated that the US resident limited partners would be able to claim treaty benefits, but only in the appropriate circumstances, such as in recovery proceedings brought by the tax authorities. However, the US resident limited partners could not claim treaty benefits in the appeal before the full federal court because the relevant assessment was correctly issued to RCF4, not the limited partners. And the fourth and final issue is, can RCF4 rely on a public ruling? The tax authorities had issued a public ruling which indicates that certain profits derived by hybrid corporate limited partnerships, where the limited partners were resident in a treaty country, were tax exempt in Australia under the treaty. That public ruling was binding on the tax authorities. RCF4 argued that it could claim the benefit of the public ruling even though it could not claim under the treaty. The full federal court held that the public ruling only addresses situations where the business profits article, Article 7 of the treaty applies. However, in RCF4's situation, Article 13 applied instead of Article 7 because the Australian holding company qualified as a land rich company. Therefore, said the court, the public ruling was not applicable to RCF4. Remember that in regard to the third issue, treaty exemption, I said that the court reached two conclusions. The first is that RCF4 is not entitled to treaty benefits under the Australia-US Treaty because it doesn't satisfy the definition of resident of the US in that treaty. And the second is that the US resident limited partners would be able to claim treaty benefits, but only in appropriate circumstances, such as in recovery proceedings brought by the tax authorities. However, the appropriate circumstances would not include the present case in which the assessment issued to RCF4 is being challenged. Now, you might wonder, would the US resident limited partners be entitled to a treaty exemption in regard to RCF4's profit, although in recovery proceedings? The answer is no. In regard to the fourth issue, can RCF4 rely on a public ruling, the court concluded that Article 13 of the treaty would apply because the Australian holding company was a land-rich company.
and Article 13 would allow unlimited Australian tax on that profit. So the US resident limited partners would be able to claim treaty benefits, but they would not qualify for an exemption under Article 7 because Article 13 would apply to allow unlimited Australian tax. The European Court of Justice delivered two landmark decisions concerning the Parent Subsidiary Directive and the Interest and Royalties Directive. The two decisions were delivered by the same judges, 13 in all, comprising a grand chamber. The two decisions both involved joint cases, all from Denmark. The Parent Subsidiary Directive decision involves two joint cases, and the Interest and Royalties Directive decision involves four joint cases, and the two decisions are very similar. I will look at the decision on the Parent Subsidiary Directive first. A simplified structure for the first joint case on the Parent Subsidiary Directive is shown on the left. A Danish company planned to pay a dividend to a Luxembourg parent company, Luxco II. It sought a ruling from the Danish tax authorities. For the purposes of the ruling application, the Danish company assumed that Luxco II would then pay its own dividends to its Luxembourg parent company, Luxco I, and that Luxco I would then pay the cash as dividends and or interest and or debt repayment to companies controlled by private equity funds established in third countries. A simplified structure for the second joined case is shown on the right. Another Danish company paid a dividend to its Cyprus parent company. The Cyprus company used the cash to pay interest and to repay debt to its parent company in Bermuda. And the Bermudan company used the cash to pay its own dividend to its US parent company. The issue in both of these cases is whether the dividends paid by the two Danish companies to parent companies established in other EU member states, Luxembourg in the first case and Cyprus in the second, qualify for exemption from Danish dividend withholding tax under the parent subsidiary directive. At the outset, it's important to note that the facts in both cases occurred before 2012. This means that the version of the parent subsidiary directive which is relevant is the 1990 version as amended in 2003. And critically, that means that the anti-abuse rule which was added to the directive in 2015 is irrelevant to these two cases. Instead, at the relevant times, the directive said only this in regard to abuse. This directive shall not preclude the application of domestic or agreement-based provisions required for the prevention of tax evasion, tax fraud or abuse. In other words, Denmark is entitled to apply domestic law provisions or agreement-based provisions to prevent tax evasion, tax fraud or abuse in regard to the directive. However, at that time, Denmark did not have any relevant domestic anti-abuse provisions. Although it did have some anti-abuse doctrines, the parties and the court accepted that they were not triggered in either of the cases. And so the Danish tax authorities argued that EU law contains an unwritten anti-abuse rule which applies to the parent subsidiary directive and the court agreed. It said this, thus in the light of the general principle of EU law that abusive practices are prohibited and of the need to ensure observance of that principle when EU law is implemented, 
the absence of domestic or agreement-based anti-abuse provisions does not affect the national authority's obligation to refuse to grant entitlement to rights provided for by the PSD where they are invoked for fraudulent or abusive ends. The court described the anti-abuse rule in this way. Proof of an abusive practice requires, first, a combination of objective circumstances in which, despite formal observance of the conditions laid down by the EU rules, the purpose of those rules has not been achieved, and second, a subjective element consisting of the intention to obtain an advantage from the EU rules by artificially creating the conditions laid down for obtaining it. Examination of a set of facts is therefore needed to establish whether the constituent elements of an abusive practice are present, and in particular whether economic operators have carried out purely formal or artificial transactions devoid of any economic or commercial justification with the essential aim of benefiting from an improper advantage. The court stated a number of related factors which are indicia of an abusive practice. A group of companies is not set up for reasons that reflect economic reality. A dividend is passed on very soon after it is received to entities which don't qualify under the parent subsidiary directive. A dividend is received by a conduit company a company where its sole activity is the receipt of dividends and their transmission to the beneficial owner or to other conduit companies. And various contracts existing between the companies involved in the financial transactions at issue, giving rise to intra-group flows of funds by the way in which the transactions are financed by the valuation of the intermediary company's equity and by the conduit company's inability to have economic use of the dividends received. In this connection, such indications are capable of being constituted not only by a contractual or legal obligation of the parent company receiving the dividends to pass them on to a third party, but also by the fact that in substance, as the referring court states, that company, without being bound by such a contractual or legal obligation, does not have the right to use and enjoy those dividends. As you can see, the court's decision was significantly influenced by the OECD commentary on the beneficial owner condition in Article 10 of the OECD Model Treaty. Let's now look at the four joint cases on the Interest and Royalties Directive. A simplified structure for the first case is shown on the left. Denmark Co. paid interest to Luxco 2, which paid interest to Luxco 1, and which in turn paid interest to a number of private equity funds established in third countries. A simplified structure for the second case is shown on the right. Denmark Co. paid interest to Sweden Co. 2, which made a group contribution under Sweden's tax loss transfer system to Sweden Co. 1, which in turn paid interest to Luxco, which the Danish tax authorities viewed as a transparent entity for Danish tax purposes. Luxco was owned by a number of private equity funds established in third countries. A simplified structure for the third case is shown on the left. Denmark Co paid interest to Sweden Co 2, which made a group contribution to Sweden Co 1, which in turn paid interest to Cayman Islands Co. And a simplified structure for the fourth case is shown on the right. Denmark Co paid interest to Luxco, which in turn paid interest to a number of private equity funds established in third countries.
The issue in all four of these cases is whether the interest paid by the Danish companies to the lenders established in other EU member states, Luxembourg in two of the cases and Sweden in the other two cases, qualifies for exemption from Danish interest withholding tax under the Interest and Royalties Directive. Let me quickly run through the key provisions which are relevant in these cases. Firstly, Article 1.1 says this, Interest payments arising in a member state shall be exempt from any taxes imposed on those payments in that state, provided that the beneficial owner of the interest is a company of another member state. Secondly, Article 1.4 defines beneficial owner. A company of a member state shall be treated as the beneficial owner of interest only if it receives those payments for its own benefit and not as an intermediary such as an agent, trustee or authorised signatory for some other person. Let me pause there to make a few comments. The use of the beneficial owner concept has obviously been borrowed from the OECD model treaty. Also, you can see the influence of the OECD commentary on Article 1.4, its own benefit and not as an intermediary. But see the phrase, such as an agent, trustee or authorised signatory. There's no reference to a conduit company which might be explained by the fact that the Interest and Royalties Directive and the amendments to the OECD commentary in regard to conduit companies were both finalised at about the same time. And the third relevant provision is Article 5, which deals with fraud and abuse. 1. This directive shall not preclude the application of domestic or agreement-based provisions required for the prevention of fraud or abuse. Two, member states may, in the case of transactions for which the principal motive or one of the principal motives is tax evasion, tax avoidance or abuse, withdraw the benefits of this directive or refuse to apply this directive. Let me pause here as well. Article 5.1 is in effectively the same form as Article 1.2 of the Parent Subsidiary Directive. And as we've already seen, during the relevant years, Denmark did not have a relevant anti-abuse provision in its legislation. But when you look at Article 5.2, you might think that this provision can be directly applied by the Danish tax authorities. But apparently that's not right the courts seem to indicate that the Danish tax authorities would be able to apply Article 5.2 only if it had been transposed into Danish law, which it had not. Well, the first issue addressed by the court was the meaning of the term beneficial owner. The court made a number of comments. Firstly, the term beneficial owner concerns not a formally identified recipient, but rather the entity which benefits economically from the interest received, and accordingly has the power freely to determine the use to which it is put. Secondly, the OECD commentary on Article 11 is relevant in determining the meaning of the term beneficial owner. And thirdly, in regard to conduit companies, it is clear from the development of the OECD Model Tax Convention and the commentaries relating thereto that the concept of beneficial owner excludes conduit companies and must be understood not in a narrow technical sense, but as having a meaning that enables double taxation to be avoided and tax evasion and avoidance to be prevented. The second issue addressed by the court was effectively whether the Danish tax authorities could rely on the same EU law anti-abuse rule which was covered in its decision on the parent subsidiary directive joined cases. Not surprisingly, 
the court gave the same analysis as there, almost word for word. And the third issue addressed by the court relates to the situation where the interest and royalties directive does not apply for reasons other than fraud or abuse. For example, the required level of association between the payer and recipient companies is not satisfied. In that context, the third issue was this. Would Denmark's imposition of interest withholding tax on the interest paid to the Luxembourg or Swedish companies be invalid because it would breach the free movement of capital guaranteed by Article 63 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. The court answered this question, yes, for two reasons. The first reason is that under Danish tax law, there's a significant cash flow difference between, firstly, interest paid by a resident company to a non-resident company, and secondly, interest paid by a resident company to another resident company. In the first situation, withholding tax is imposed up front on payment of the interest. In the second situation, a resident company recipient is not required to make an advance payment of corporation tax during its first two tax years. And the second reason relates to gross versus net taxation. With withholding tax, the non-resident recipient company cannot deduct interest payments which directly relate to the relevant loan. Whereas in the case of a resident recipient company, it is entitled to deduct such interest payments. In case you're wondering whether the tax authorities or the taxpayers won, I'm afraid you'll have to wait until the referring Danish court applies the ECJ's principles to the actual facts of each case. The next case is a decision of Finland's Supreme Administrative Court, and it concerns transfer pricing. This has been called a landmark decision in Finland. From an international perspective, it's noteworthy in regard to the issue of whether updates to the OECD transfer pricing guidelines should be given retrospective effect and also the related issue of when the profit split method should be used. Here are the relevant facts. ACO, a Finnish resident company, is the parent of a European group which manufactures and sells insulation products. ACO enters into three types of cross-border related party transactions. The first type of transaction is the licensing of manufacturing IP. ACO licensed that IP to related party manufacturing companies in Finland, Poland, Sweden and Lithuania in return for royalties. ACO set and defended the royalty rates by applying the comparable uncontrolled price method. The second type of transaction is the sale of raw materials from ACO to the related party manufacturing companies in Finland, Poland, Sweden and Lithuania. ACO set and defended the sale price by applying the cost plus method. And the third type of transaction is the sale of Finnish goods from the manufacturing companies in Finland to related party sales companies in 13 European countries. The sale prices for these transactions were set and defended by the resale price method. The Finnish tax administration rejected ACO's use of the CUP, cost plus and resale price methods. Instead, it concluded that the group's business operations were highly integrated and that the key profit driver was ACO's manufacturing IP. It therefore applied a residual profit split method. 
it allocated a routine return to each of the sales companies and manufacturing companies. And then the residual group profit was allocated to ACO. An important point to note in this case is that the tax years in dispute were 2006 to 2008. This means that the version of the OECD transfer pricing guidelines, which was current at the time ACO filed its tax returns for those years, was the 1995 version. The 1995 guidelines set a very high threshold for the use of the two profit-based methods, profit split and TNMM. Firstly, the 1995 guidelines indicate that a profit-based method should be used only in exceptional situations and cases of last resort. Paragraph 2.49 says this, Traditional transaction methods are the most direct means of establishing whether conditions in the commercial and financial relations between associated enterprises are arm's length. As a result, traditional transaction methods are preferable to other methods. However, the complexities of real life business situations may put practical difficulties in the way of the application of the traditional transaction methods. In those exceptional situations where there are no data available or the available data are not of sufficient quality to rely solely or at all on the traditional transaction methods, it may become necessary to address whether and under what conditions other methods may be used. And paragraph 3.50 states, there are, however, cases where traditional transaction methods cannot be reliably applied alone or exceptionally cannot be applied at all. These would be considered cases of last resort. Such cases arise only where there is insufficient data on uncontrolled transactions, possibly because of uncooperative behaviour on the part of the taxpayer relative to these guidelines, or where such data are considered unreliable or due to the nature of the business situation. In such cases of last resort, practical considerations may suggest application of a transactional profit split method, either in conjunction with traditional transaction methods or on its own. The 1995 guidelines also suggest that the profit split method should be used when transactions are very interrelated and they can't be evaluated on a separate basis. Paragraph 3.5 says this in the introduction to the profit split method. Where transactions are very interrelated, it might be that they cannot be evaluated on a separate basis. Under similar circumstances, independent enterprises might decide to set up a form of partnership and agree to a form of profit split. Accordingly, the profit split method seeks to eliminate the effect on profits of special conditions made or imposed in a controlled transaction or in controlled transactions that are appropriate to aggregate under the principles of Chapter 1 by determining the division of profits that independent enterprises would have expected to realise from engaging in the transaction or transactions. Later versions of the OECD guidelines have reduced the threshold for the use of the profit-based methods. Firstly, the 2010 version of the guidelines deleted the references to exceptional situations and cases of last resort. However, they retained a clear preference for the traditional transaction methods, and in particular, the cup method over the profit-based methods. And now the 2017 version of the guidelines, after the profit split update in 2018, has removed that preference for the traditional transaction methods.
and the situations in which the profit split method should be used have been expanded in later versions of the guidelines. In the 2010 guidelines, there were two situations identified. Firstly, highly integrated operations, and secondly, where both parties make unique and valuable contributions. In the 2017 guidelines, after the 2018 update, a third situation has been added. Shared assumption of economically significant risks or separate assumption of closely related risks. Those guidelines also include a list of 16 examples of where the profit split method should or should not be used. Finland's Supreme Administrative Court held that the version of the guidelines which should govern this case is the version which was current at the time ACO filed its tax returns for the disputed tax years, 2006 to 2008. That was the 1995 version of the guidelines. This means that the official policy of the Finnish Tax Administration, that changes to the guidelines have retrospective effect, was rejected. And as you might expect, the court held that the Tax Administration had failed to satisfy the very high threshold which the 1995 guidelines establish for the use of profit-based methods. In particular, the court held that although ACO owned the manufacturing IP, this case was not an exceptional situation and the group transactions were not very interrelated. The court also held that it was possible for the tax administration to test ACO's use of the three traditional transaction methods and, if necessary, make adjustments to the comparables which ACO had used. And so the tax administration's use of the profit split method was rejected. And the last case in my Premier League selection is a decision of the Danish Supreme Court in a transfer pricing case concerning Microsoft. Here are the relevant facts. The taxpayer is Microsoft Denmark. Microsoft Denmark provides marketing services to Microsoft Ireland, which is the group's software distribution company in the EMEA region. Microsoft Denmark is strictly a service company. All license contracts are between Microsoft Ireland and the customers. In addition, Microsoft Denmark's activities do not cause Microsoft Ireland to have a PE in Denmark. Microsoft Ireland has two types of customer in Denmark. The first is Danish original equipment manufacturers. Microsoft Ireland licenses software to the Danish OEMs. This is shown as type 1 in the diagram. The Danish OEMs then install the software on the computers they manufacture. The other customers are Danish retail dealers. Microsoft Ireland licenses software packages to the retail dealers type 2 in the diagram. The retail dealers then distribute the packages to Danish end users. Multinational OEMs, which are not based in Denmark, sell computer equipment to Danish end users. That computer equipment contains pre-installed Microsoft software, pursuant to software licenses granted to the multinational OEMs by Microsoft US. License type 3 in the diagram. For its marketing services to Microsoft Ireland, Microsoft Denmark is paid a fee, which has a commission component. It was this commission which was the focus of the dispute in the case. But interestingly, the dispute was not over the commission rate. Instead, it was over the base for the commission calculation. Specifically, the issue was this. 
Should Microsoft Denmark's commission be calculated only on software licenses type 1 and type 2? These are the licenses granted by Microsoft Ireland. Or should it also be calculated on software licenses type 3, to the extent that sales of equipment are made to Danish end users? In answering this question, the court addressed two issues, one dealing with contract interpretation and the other dealing with transfer pricing. The first issue was whether, as a matter of contract interpretation, the marketing services contract between Microsoft Denmark and Microsoft Ireland required the Type 3 licenses to be included in the base for commission calculation. Surprisingly, the court was split on this issue. The majority of three judges said no, it did not, whereas the minority of two judges said yes, it did. The second issue focused on transfer pricing. Does the arm's length principle require that the Type 3 licenses be included in the base for commission calculation? The argument by the tax authorities was that Microsoft Denmark's marketing efforts had a positive spillover effect on the sale of computer equipment in Denmark by the multinational OEMs. That, in turn, provided a financial benefit to Microsoft US. And, in an arm's length situation, the provider of that benefit, Microsoft Denmark, would be compensated. Interestingly, on this second issue, the judges also split three to two, with the same judges in the majority and the minority. The majority said, no, the arm's length principle does not require that the Type 3 licenses be included. They gave two reasons. The first reason was this. The majority accepted that Microsoft Denmark's marketing activities would have provided an indirect benefit to the sales of equipment by the multinational OEMs and thus an indirect benefit to Microsoft US. But there was also an indirect benefit moving in the opposite direction. The marketing of the computer equipment by the multinational OEMs with the pre-installed Microsoft software would have provided an indirect benefit to the sales performance of the Type 2 licenses, the licenses of software packages to the Danish retail dealers. And that indirect benefit would have increased Microsoft Denmark's base for the commission calculation. Importantly, the majority said that it was unlikely that the size of the first indirect benefit exceeded the size of the second indirect benefit. For its second reason, the majority said that it was unlikely that an independent marketing company in the position of Microsoft Denmark could obtain remuneration for sales which were made in Denmark by the multinational OEMs in the situation where those sales were made without any participation by the independent marketing company. Here's my selection of the best of the rest. The Satium case from Australia, in which the court held that a double tax treaty can increase the source country's tax rights. Now, I would have selected this case to be in my Premier League, except for the fact that the substantive decision was delivered in 2018 by the full federal court. But in 2019, the taxpayer's request for appeal was rejected. There's the Indostar Capital case, which concerns the capital gains article in the India-Mauritius Treaty and the Vodafone Anti-Avoidance Doctrine. Chatfield's case, an interesting case on the Exchange of Information article under the Korea-New Zealand Treaty.
a Netherlands case in regard to high interest rate convertible debt. The taxpayer won on the transfer pricing issues, but then lost on the Dutch anti-avoidance doctrine. An interesting case from Norway on the attribution of profits to a PE under Article 7. An amazing case from Kenya, in which the Kenya Mauritius Treaty was declared to be legally ineffective. A US decision in which subpart F regulations dating back to 1964 were held to be valid. Two cases from India on the PE definition. Same taxpayer, same facts, but different years, different judges, and different results. And finally, two interesting VAT cases from the EU. Well, that's the way it is this Friday, the 31st of May, 2019. I'm Steve Towers. Have a great weekend.